Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to a uh, much belated stream. The first proper stream of 2022 only took five months. I think I was evening, ladies and gentlemen. Discussing, oh. discussing with Mr. Hat, who is my guest this evening, uh, about the last time that I streamed, which was uh, something like the 15th of November the 15th of November, champs, which is Oof. a long, long time ago. It's me, been a while. Yeah. Let me pop the... I can turn off various bits and pieces here. So we're now we're now live. Welcome. Welcome to the stream. You may notice there's a new stream background, uh, as this is no not Fake Accents Unite, and it's not uh, various other bits and pieces. Didn't really have anything massively suitable, but... It would be nice to uh, nice to have things. If people say the audio is a bit sharp. I will turn myself down slightly, but hopefully, Mr. Hat is still audible. Marvelous. I hope so. I hope so. My mic is a bit finicky these days. Uh... So there, there we go. All righty. So this stream, uh, as you may have guessed from the title, is entitled uh, History of Everyday Things in England, 1733 to 1851, brackets 1952, which is uh, seems very, very specific. Um, yes. And I would say uh, definitely it is specific. This is a reading and discussion of... Uh, a book of the same name, and it is part of a four-part four part series by uh, Marjorie and, I don't know, it says C.H.B. Quinnell on the front, but it's a husband and wife uh, duo. There's uh, an interesting bit of uh, kind of connection to this in the sense that uh, there was a, a, a study done on this, okay, by, on ResearchGate, which uh, talks about how these books ushered in a new popular social history, the history of everyday life. So you may you may recall, um, as I'm sure Mr. Hatt from his more classical education will recall, that history was very much a case of names and dates and uh, and kings and queens. And uh, this book, published in 1952, but this is the actual uh, actually the um, the sixth sixth edition, I believe. So they are a little bit older than that. I think they were published through the early part mm -hmm. of the 20th century, um, ushered in a new way of looking at history, um, sort of through the, the lens of everyday life. And it's really interesting for a, for a number of reasons, not least of which is that the writer writing as they are from the time period that they are inhabits a very different England to the one that we know today, yes, and, and um, which you'll, you'll hopefully see and comes across through the text. Now, to to aid us in our exploration here, I do have the uh, uh, a PDF of the second edition of this book, which contains many of the same illustrations. So, whilst uh, the text on screen won't be exactly the same as what we're going to go through today, hopefully the the illustrations will. Uh, give you an, an inkling of uh, what we're saying and if they're referencing any of these uh, illustrations, as they do, uh, that they will all make sense. And I've brought Mr. Mr. Hatt along because as a, an austere an austere religious scholar that he is. <laughs> I, wouldn't call myself, I wouldn't call myself austere. Uh, I, I don't know if you yeah. remember, I'm re re uh, referencing a particular news article that referred to yes. Osama bin Laden. <laughs> a steer, a steer religious scholar, Osama bin Laden, or whoever it was. Indeed. <laughs> um, who, who has uh, has an interest as well in, in this sort of, uh, sort of thing, and also in the ways in which we educated our youth in in the before times yes indeed say. so there we go i'm going to uh, i'm going to start with the preface and we'll be making relatively frequent stops i'm sure to discuss sort of what comes up but this is going to be a very relaxed stream if it's successful uh, i'm expecting it to run for 90 minutes to two hours if it's if it's uh, successful uh, then i will do parts two three and four which are uh, you know, about uh, the various different bits and pieces. And so, without further ado, here we go. The preface begins. The boys and girls for whom we write will know that we are mainly concerned with showing people at work, 
and that it does not matter what the work is so long as it is interesting. And we might add, if work is natural and proper, then it cannot be uninteresting. Now, just as, a, just as an intro as this goes, uh, it should be very clear as well, this book is written for children, although as we go on, <laughs> Uh, it gets quite in-depth. I, I truly believe that we could probably set up our own Trumpton-esque farm uh, yes. with, the, with the knowledge contained in this book, especially when it comes to the manufacturing of seed drills and stuff and like it's that. Worth, it's, it's worth pointing out, of course, that, that children were not always so, so brainless as they are now. Um, ch most children, even regardless of whether they were upper class or not, would have had a much more in-depth understanding of various learned things. But it's uh, um, it's also the case that if you're going to send your children off to be educated, or if you're going to purchase a book to educate children, uh, this was a very expensive endeavour, and yeah. you expected to get your money's worth out of it, even if they didn't understand all of it right now, and they uh, went back to it back in the day. And of course, they didn't have all of the modern distractions, TikTok and mm. uh, video games and, and all of this other stuff, trying to compete for their attention, advertising, goodness gracious. Yes, so. and um, <clears throat> I mean, even recently, um, I remember when, when, when I was a kid, uh, a book came out that I had called The Dangerous Book for Boys. I don't know if you remember this one, Mark. I do, uh, I do, but explain. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful because it, it was sort of this old school compendium of just interesting things. Like... On one page, you'd have, like, a history of the Battle of Rourke's Drift. On the next page, how to build a go-kart. On the next page, how to grind a fountain pen nib to be italic. On the next page, various Latin, <laughs> Latin <laughs> sort of grammar. To, it just, just, just <clears throat> collected interesting things. Um, I remember one was uh, a brief history of artillery on one page. It was just wonderful. I love all these things, and especially as it, when you're a child and you're very, very hungry for knowledge, you know, you don't want to be um, presented with uh, like biff and chip on a daily basis. Oh, exactly. You feel like your your repertoire, your intellectual repertoire could have been expanded far beyond. And in fact, this kind of ties into the, the kind of aristocratic um, mentoring uh, sort of mode of education, which was common for mm -hmm. the upper uh, and, and the upper middle class at the time. Yes. So, uh, if work is natural and proper, then it cannot be uninteresting. For example, take cleaning out a cattle yard deep in manure. If you are a farmer or gardener, you will be looking ahead to the crops which you will grow with the aid of the manure, and the smelly job becomes interesting. And uh, <laughs> how many of us could say that we cleared a... Cleared a uh, cattle yard of manure nowadays, goodness. Mm. It will be found that work divides itself quite naturally into three great trades. Men must eat, so the farmer's trade is the most important one. It does not matter whether the breakfast bacon comes from Denmark, or the dinner's mutton from New Zealand, the cheese from Canada, and the eggs from China. It is the farmer. Well, I wouldn't take that risk now. No, 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 not anymore. <laughs> take Chinese eggs. I take my my bantam hen eggs any day. Yeah. Absolutely. Burford brines are the uh, the egg of choice for me. <laughs> <clears throat> it is the farmer who feeds you, and through the, though the food may be packed in a tin, this was not its natal couch. <laughs> I'm trying to explain to a child natal couch vocabulary really has uh, has <clears throat> dropped. The farmer. I love a good natal couch. Yeah. I love a good natal couch. The farmer grows the raw materials for the second great trade, this being clothing. The fleeces of his sheep are woven into cloth, the hides of his cattle make shoes, and the flax he grows the linen. The third great trade is the builders. He provides the houses. All other trades are subsidiary and relatively unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we could again, you get this kind of flavour of the the author's perspective on this, but also the way in which, uh, as it will become clear as we keep reading, um, life revolved primarily around these trays in a way in which it doesn't yes. with the global supply chain today, because all of these trades were localised, 
and and were things which were done in Britain. There was no outsourcing to a Portuguese factory for for shirts, for instance. No, exactly. And that sort of thing. You, you 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 would probably know the the personal place the shirt on your back came from. You'd know where the wool came from, etc. Yes, indeed. Until the end of the 18th century, we carried on these three great trades by ourselves, for ourselves, and with the surplus over and beyond our needs, paid for luxuries, like wine, which we imported. In the 19th century, from a variety of causes, all of which seemed very reasonable, this natural balance began to be disturbed. <laughs> mm -hmm. The emigrants who went to America and Australia sent home for the goods which they could not manufacture themselves, and paid us for them with foodstuffs grown on virgin soils. More and more it began to pay us to manufacture these goods, and so this industrial revolution altered our mode of living. It was rooted in money instead of in the land. Hmm. Shame, shame. Yes, the moneyed merchant class rising in power, you know. It's very much uh, a curious insight uh, across the course of this book, really, into the collaboration. And I, I know that some... We live in a different world now, but yeah. it's curious for, say, uh, anyone who's interested in kind of either libertarian styles of living or uh, in America, you know, the kind of homesteading uh, mm. kind of aesthetic and really understanding what the the perils are involved in that sort of endeavor, but also yeah. kind of what that, that the sort of things that you would naturally expect the kind of um, trials and tribulations that, that come with living from the land rather than from a supply chain connected to someone else living off the land. Yes, exactly. Um, you'd, you'd have a much more authentic connection with it, you know. Um, uh, someone in the chat has just said, sounds a bit uh, pro-commie. And I, I, as you will see... Uh, a lot of ideas which might lead to autistic screeching on Twitter of, uh, you know, that sounds a bit communist to me, were actually very, um, the idea of a lot of more communal living and the interconnectedness of every member of a community uh, were, were paramount. And I truly believe that um, moving away from this is, is very negative. We have various ways in which we can go back to it whilst avoiding some of the pitfalls you know through modern technology etc that um allow us to make life a lot easier you know and not expecting yeah. the child mortality of the 1800s <laughs> to come back for instance but um yeah that's that's the idea so the idea of this book is to contrast these two modes of living the simple, natural methods of the 18th century, which first began in England, when Neolithic man planted his crops on the lynchets and tended his flocks on the downs, and the modern industrialism, which is so recent and difficult and complicated. We cannot, of course, do more than touch on the many problems with which man has been confronted, but we had... Uh, but we shall pay especial attention to the difficulties which he has had to overcome. Man is a cantankerous animal, very frequently wrong-headed and perverse. He will run a heel line with the greatest joy and cause his friends despair, but he is ingenious and skillful, so much must be admitted. We will show him exhibiting his ingenuity and skill. So, <laughs> that's so uh, one hell of a pre preface, I would say. Yeah. Um, and Good. again, you can see that there's kind of this idea, this underlying, what I would call it, an underlying Christian idea of uh, man as imperfect, which is, is quite... Yes, yes. Uh, well, man is being fundamentally low, but he is able to sometimes reach heights. There is, yes, there is no sense of, uh, well, that man who ran heel line to the despair of his friends, those clearly just weren't good enough friends. Uh, you were perfect <laughs> just the way you are, you know. <laughs> mm. Deary me. Uh, so here we come to chapter one, which is all about farming. And I hope this will be enjoyable for you all. Indeed. So when the industrial age dawned on Great Britain during the first half of the 18th century, it heralded the disappearance of a way of life. 
the life of the fields, the villages and the country towns that had continued for many hundred years with few important alterations. Agriculture felt the effect of this change at a very early period when Tull and Bakewell between them revolutionized the practice of farming. But to understand the Jethro Tull, of course. Sorry, say again. Jethro Tull, the Jeth great uh, Jethro, Tull. Jethro Tull, the great agriculturalist who there's also a band named that, I believe, or a singer who took that name. Yes, uh, uh, seems to ring a bell. We will Jeff get Tull. we will get into Mr. Tull and his endeavors and his the resistances to his endeavors yes. uh, in a couple of pages. So look forward to that. To understand the revolutionary effect they produced, we must know something about the condition of rural England before they started on their work. And this is truly fascinating to me, I must say. As an example of the English agricultural system in its simple early form, and you shall note the, uh, the drawing, uh, I appreciate that it's in uh, portrait, not landscape. Um, in fact, maybe I, can, maybe I can just rotate this image here, transform. Rotate 90 degrees clockwise. Nope, that's the background. Oh. <laughs> uh, transform. Uh, let's put that back. Let's pop the window capture. Transform. Rotate. There we go. So you can see this image here. I'll just make it a little larger for people. So this is their town that they're referencing. Uh, as an example of the English agricultural system in its simple early form, here's a bird's eye view of our hometown of Great Berkhamstead, also known as Berkhamstead, <laughs> in Hertfordshire during the early part of the 13th century. The three common fields that you can see in the south of the image here uh, were to the south of the town. Wheat and rye were sown in one of these, and barley, oats, peas, and beans in the second, while the third was left fallow. The fields were cut up into narrow strips or half acre strips and divided from one another by grass banks called balks. As a mm. man, as a man would have holdings in each of the three fields, much time was wasted going from one field to another. The two fields in cultivation were fenced off from the sowing to the harvest, after which the fences were taken down and the cattle driven in by the herdsmen to feed off the stubble and the weeds. The, meadow for hay, the meadows for hay were treated in the same fashion, cut up into strips and fenced off between Lady Day and Midsummer Day when the hay was cut. This is another thing that I've noticed reading this, which is that there is a lot of reference to various festivals that are no yeah. longer observed. Yes, there are a huge amount of agricultural days that were celebrated that that yeah completely fallen out of use now um, for for about a hundred years or so. You know these things really haven't lasted, unfortunately. I would say, really, in the in the modern age, there's only maybe two two holidays that really. I don't even want to use the term bring us together. I mean, we have Christmas and Easter, right? Mm -hmm. And Christmas is so commercial now. Um, it at least bonds families together, but it doesn't have uh, a kind of a sense of uh, the same kind of community necessarily. I say outside of uh, some community groups and churches who make an effort to outreach on that day or, yeah. you know, people who, who only go to to service once a year, for instance. Christmas Catholics and the like. Fair weather Christians, if they're talking, mm. you know. Yes. Um, so, in a sense, it, it's important to understand how much we've lost in terms of our heritage. And part of this isn't uh, due to, you know, inc the increasing modernization. But um, take, for instance, the, uh, the, you know, the First and Second World War, and a lot of the colonial wars as well, people would have been away for these festivals. Um, mm -hmm. and, and over time, uh, especially during the era when uh, if you joined the military, you would join with your friends, you would all go into the same battalion and then you would all die together. You would, um, y y entire, entire towns were lost. And so many local festivals and that sort of thing would also have been lost. Yes. Um, so there we go. So after 
Uh, the meadows for hay are cut up into strips and uh, fenced off when the hay was cut. The fences would come down and the cattle were allowed to graze. The waste, or common, was for the pigs and the cattle when the fields failed. So, right. uh, and on these wastelands, people went wooding to find what they could by hook or by crook. Yes, you, you would... Th- so you always have to take into account the fact that the harvest could fail in, in any given year. So you have these kind of other things that you do to make sure that there's something at least to eat. Um, and as you pointed out, people would comb through... like you, Nothing would, would be left to waste. And it, it's not that these people would have eaten... That, you know, they, 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 they would have had pro- probably most of the time, you know, plenty of food. But you'd still comb through and make sure that you had every last morsel that you could get your hands on. I mean, um, there, there's lots of things. I mean, obviously, flour ke- keeps and stuff like that. And they, there was definitely surpluses, which were um, which were which were held uh, by, and will will come to punishments for for violating those those mm. uh, storages uh, at some point. But also, Uh-oh. we've got more people complaining about about us sounding like communists in the oh, chat i mean I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just say i mean if you've ever been to a village in england or anywhere in europe you'll know that every village has a part of it which is called something common something common the, the idea being that this field has been bequeathed not to a single person but to the community as a whole to the village mm. to to the county the idea the idea that it's not as such owned that it's free for everyone's use which i think is that's, that's basically what a public park is just Yes, it's absolutely. Just and it, it was also the, you know, the, the impetus behind things like the National Trust um, and, and other institutions which looked after the common land. And yes, exactly. The establishment, of, the establishment of local councils, despite how much they may encroach into life and projects oh, These nowadays. are ancient ideas. It's Mark, yes. I, I have to worry, because you, you obviously you haven't streamed for a while. And um, I, I don't know, so... Are there people that that are still hanging around that are like hardcore, like libertarians from sort of like twenty twenty sixteen era or so? I don't um, know. Uh, I'm gonna get sort of a bit. Yeah, I'm not massively massively familiar with the, the political disposition of every member of my uh, right. of the audience, but uh, I hope that people are enjoying it at the very least. It's a different well, take. It's this a, is a reactionary. Uh, channel now we want to return to <laughs> the era of the village common um with some caveats um, with some caveats. as we say but yes yeah, so you had these and you'll notice that three fields is not very many and, and one of the things we should really uh, make plain is that the population of england was very small the population yes. of the earth was very small um, and you know these towns uh, they may be uh, several hundred in number, but uh, it's, it's not like it's a town of 30,000, for instance. And it was no. often surrounded by um, cultivated and looked after, but um, relatively wild woodland, which allowed for the foraging when the fields failed. And it was a, a very much a, a balance, as you say, uh, of, of maintaining the land as much as anything else. Um, yes. So, yes, when it says people went wooding, they basically went out looking for mushrooms and, uh, and other wild goods by hook or by crook. The rams and the bulls were the property of the parish. There you go, communal property, as were the cumbersome ploughs drawn perhaps by oxen. There is actually um, quite a, a similar thing in modern agriculture now where uh, combine harvesters are very, very expensive and are yes. only used for a very short period of the time. And a lot of farmers will rent them. They rent them out, yes. The, 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 the combine will be transported from farm to farm throughout the season. Um, and uh, this is very common with lots of machinery even still now. Um, I know that uh, back in the day, the big steam traction engines were... It was very rare to actually own one. You would simply... You would, it, you, you would either take it... You would have a, a seasonal license from the company to use it for a certain amount of time or it would be owned by a major landowner and he would simply uh rotate it to each of his tenants or farms that he had a stake in Mm. um for example absolutely there were mills where the corn could be ground and in places like berkhamstead markets where butter eggs and poultry could be bought and sold 
I myself mm-hmm. come from a, a market town. Yeah, uh, so the, do I. The cattle, the cattle market that I uh, grew up literally about 40 feet from, um, which is still, still operating today, bless it. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so there we go. The exchange of commodities was a much simpler business than it is today, and the supply was regulated by a demand that could be estimated almost a half a pound of butter. The, it, again, just like ba- the balance there, people did not um, sow more than they needed, uh, mm. and communities rose and fell on how they maintained that balance because yes. everything was a, a scarce commodity. The, the inns for refreshment were opposite the marketplace, the church where citizens worshipped close by. Again, uh, a, a pre- prevalent theme through this whole book. Uh, it's a very uh, Christian community. Uh, England was a very Christian country. It was very religious yes. and uh, very important to have the church nearby, of course. Yeah, the church would have also had a great amount of organizational sway when it came to the farming. Um, church, very, very often the churches would have had a lot of input there. And uh, of course, the tithes at various times would, would, have, would have been paid um, to, the, to the church. Um, I, I believe for most of history, it was a tenth. Yes, tenth that, that's the, the standard. Tithe, yes. Although it must also be noted that because of the... Um, I, I can't remember who it was who decided that, that the Bible in England should be able to be read by everyone. Um, various various reformers, so-called reformers. <laughs> we won't dredge up the Protestant-Catholic divide too much, but the um, it is the case that if you did not have an educated man in the village who or the town who could read uh, these things, they would uh, basically be sent off to a, a kind of a crash course in all of the different... Um, like usually a man of repute in the community, sent off for a crash course in uh, the festivals and uh, ceremonies, uh, you know, marriage and uh, and funerals and that sort of thing. And they would yeah. learn them by rote, even if they were illiterate. They would they would learn them by rote. And very, then, very effective method, though. Effective, yes. But although yeah. it must be said, this had an interesting effect in that, um, other than these festivals, etc. <laughs> They could basically make up what they wanted. So there's an interesting um, kind of split through all of this time, uh, in all, yeah. not just in the Protestant sects, but various others. And you can see why Catholicism was also very um, uh, popular in, in a sense, because they, whenever they had a question that needed to be answered uh, or something that needed to be planned, there was a central authority they could actually uh, draw yeah. that information from. Uh, which in an era before the information age was, must have been somewhat of a blessing. Indeed. Um, yes, very sort of yeah, popular in that sense. And also because um, the church was quite cent- central to life in a sense that... Um, so... I'm trying to think how to... So, obviously, um, we like to think in the modern world that we are somehow better off than the people of this time. But I think that actually we're, we're a lot worse off in terms of in terms of what we have and what we don't have. For example, this sort of life in a, in a rural English village, everyone would have been working quite hard a lot of the time, but you would have had an enormous... I think it was something like a third or half of the year were actually rest days. They were holy days or saint days or, 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 or feast days when work was not required. Um, yes, we've mentioned the, the many festivals yeah. we kind of, we've lost, as it were, and they yeah. were fairly frequent, fairly frequent. But I mean, for, for example, you know, there might be a week where, oh, well, this, this, this Tuesday, it's the, it's the day of, it's, it's the day of the canonization of, I don't know, St. Januarius or something, so we don't have to work on that day. And then on, on the next week, on the, on the, on the Friday, it's, it's the, it's the canonization of so-and-so, so that's, that's not, that's a rest day too. So, because the thing is about a lot of agricultural work and other types of this sort of work as well, is that you don't have to be going at it every day. A lot of it is actually seasonal. Um, there'll be quite large chunks of time where you don't actually, like, other, other than sort of, like, maintaining your house and land and, like, pruning hedgerows and things, you're not, you're not going to be out there plowing every day. You know, that's, that's something you do once a year. Indeed. Or twice, depending on the crop. You know, it, it's, it, it's a much... 
It's a much fairer schedule than the average wagey, if you will, who's dragging himself off to work 365 practically um, days a year, you know. Slub away in some office that he doesn't own, you know. Terrible. It's a, it's a different kind. I mean, you, you see the direct result of the work of your hands. Um, and so certainly I would say spiritually, and I, I don't even mean that exclusively in the Christian sense, but spiritually seems much more in tune with... Uh, a kind of a state of being that that we've abandoned basically yeah. so we talked about the the church then there was the smith who shot the horses and forged the plowshares mm-hmm. the wheel right the wheel right who could not only make wheels but the wagons to go on them the carpenter was a good tradesman and could construct anything in wood from a field gate to a coffin all these members of the community were dependent upon agriculture and helped to build up a healthy corporate life. <laughs> the farmers... By, 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 just to say, by, by corporate, they don't mean corporate in the modern sense. They mean incorporate, as in, as in everything was holistic. Yes. The, the idea that everybody in the village is supporting everybody else, basically. The farmers were handymen and made many of their own implements. A winter's evening was well spent by the fireside shaping a new threshing flail. Women could spin and weave, make lace and plait straw, besides milking the cows and baking bread in their brick ovens. In fact, they carried the doctrine of self-help to such extremes that they were very nearly self-supporting. Occasionally, however, there would be a fair in the marketplace where pennies could be running out of the good man's purse for luxuries. Mm-hmm. It was a civil... Well, Travelling salesmen would show up and things. Yes, and, and again, these were at regular times of the year, um, and depending on how far af- uh, abroad, because different towns had different specialities, of course, uh, depending on how far abroad the, 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 the vendors would travel, you would get different goods and uh, you know, look forward to other things. All, uh, I mentioned that already, um, it was a civilization broad based on the land and sat securely like a pyramid or stood erect, if you like, like an oak held by its knotted roots in wield and clay. Yes. I, just, I love the, the, there's a little bit of poetry, yes. a bit of poetry in it. And, uh, wield and clay. As someone who grew up in Wielden, I can certainly appreciate that. <laughs> it was beautiful too, with the same unselfconscious beauty as the oak. Unfortunately, they are becoming rarer year by year. But where will you find anything more lovely than untouched English villages? Mm, true, true. They are always in tune with nature, very largely because people were content to build with local materials. Stone in the Cotswolds, timber framing where oaks grew, and brick where there were good brick earths. Architecturally, the churches and houses may be very simple. Nevertheless, they are exactly right for their purpose. If something grander is demanded, then there are the cathedrals to justify faith by works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just love this. Yeah. This, this kind of uh, almost sniping at people who, <laughs> say, yeah. who, who would in, embark on such an endeavor. And yet, uh, very, very true. Um, these early English countrymen were not clods. They lived by faith lived in hope and practiced charity. That's capital C charity, I'll have you know. (laughs) It was very difficult for the inhabitants of such villages to change their way of life. But after all, why should they? Now I'm gonna move Mm. on to the um, the next image. And hopefully I'm just gonna reverse this transform so that it is uh, in the center of the screen. Here's our, our smith in the middle there. I hope you can see him as he comes up. Uh, after all, why should they? Especially if, as at Berkhamsted, an old castle watched over the place to remind them of their feudal origins. What had been sufficient for their fathers was good enough for them. If a man like Tull came along and suggested that by doing this, that or the other, they could improve livelihood, they remained unconvinced. Mm. And experiments were very difficult. Uh, Just a nod, I suppose, again, to uh, part of the the English character there. We're not necessarily um, uh, that that great at uh, uh, innovating on on a kind of mass cultural level. 
No, but you know why? Why? Why do that all the time? No, of course. <laughs> if but, it if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But there is an element uh, to, to that, of course, which uh, you you have to understand that if anyone made any grand changes and experimented and it went wrong, everyone would die or have to move. Yes. Right? Yeah, so, the thing. So, I mean, yeah, and also you would know everybody that died because you'd know who they were if you were in a place of power to experiment with things. And so, in, in that um, sense. Just drawing a, a reference to our contemporaries in a modern world where innovation is expected everywhere at all times by all people or else. Regardless of consequences. Irrespective of consequences. I mean, in some ways you might even uh, call it the natural, uh, the natural final form of, mm. uh, of the free market enterprise, I suppose. Where, you, you know, the idea that you know, everyone innovates and the successful ones go, go through. And uh, you just hope that we're in a place where if people fail, it doesn't completely destroy them most of the no. time. Yeah. Um, it was difficult to do things. And so you truly had to have something revolutionary in order to make an impact in these communities, um, as we will come to see they did. Mm. And so you couldn't just optimize a little bit. Uh, because if you did that and people saw it didn't really have that much of an effect, they're not going to change. It would it literally had to, um, you know, save a considerable amount of work. And in some ways, I think that's why um, we've seen a grand drop off in a lot of, um, I suppose, uh, groundbreaking innovations. Yes. Because the environment to cr uh, have those be, you know, if you were ready to bring something to market that was going to innovate, it needed to be ready. Whereas, yeah, you know, yes. how many how many tech startups are there and how many, um, you know, people who think they have a little bit of an inkling. Go along. Yeah. These people who would, who would not have even got off the floor <laughs> um, <laughs> back then because no one would fund them as well because, you know, yeah. everything. Why are you going to give your hard-earned hard -earned money to some charlatan? So what had been sufficient for their fathers was good enough for them. If a man like Toll came along and suggested by doing this, that, or the other, they could improve their livelihood, they remained unconvinced and experiments were very difficult. You could not, for example, cross-plough your long, narrow strips in the common fields, nor could you afford to waste time in observation. At the appointed time, down came the fences and the cattle nosed their way over your ground. But though the open field system of agriculture did not lend itself to experiment, it had much to recommend it. Mm -hmm. It was based on cooperation. If it did not produce a large quantity of foodstuff per acre, it still kept many people usefully employed and helped over styles a good many lame dogs who have since got left behind. I just, it's a really curious phrasing there because they're obviously not, um, not referring to actual mm -hmm. lame dogs. They're no. referring to people, yeah, um, and and in a sense, looking after members of your community, even the ne'er do wells, <laughs> the yeah. the freeloaders or the the infirm, which is interesting. From an economical point of view, there was little point in trying to grow more food than you needed. It was difficult to exchange since the roads were so bad that wheeled traffic was nearly impossible. Where, as at Berkhamsted, the little township had been built on a road that was already old when the Romans came, and some traces of the foundations that they had added could be found to prevent a wagon sinking in up to its axles, traffic, yeah. traffic could move to and fro. But elsewhere, even in the 18th century, the manufacturer who wished to transport his goods had to depend upon the pack horse. Off the Roman roads, the twisting country lanes had begun their life as paths between the common fields, up to the waste and so across it, avoiding quagmire and puddles by wide detours until the next village was reached. Mm -hmm. yeah, you didn't just uh, bulldoze your way through such things. And, uh, no, you did. No. And quite, quite difficult. Them. There were few great towns, by modern standards at least, until the Industrial Revolution, and London itself was closely encircled by the country. Cobbett, in 1823, writes of a field of wheat at Earl's Court, set among the market gardens. Wonderful. <laughs> Can you imagine? In Earl's Court. Oh, Earl's God. Court. The, the meat the cities needed was driven in on foot. 
turkeys from Norfolk and cattle from Kent. We noticed once when we were motoring down the old Kent Road that dismal, vulgar-looking public houses still retained pleasant old names as a reminder of a time when they were inns for the refreshment of drovers bringing their cattle yeah. to Smithfield. The, the Turk's Head. Mm. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And again, it's like the, the dilapidation of the public house as... Uh, being seen as not just a central hub for a community alongside the church, of course, but as a, a station for visitors and that sort of thing. You, and people would come and visit. Yes. Uh, we must not forget that... Public house. Yes. We must not forget that before James Watt perfected his steam engine, man had no other source of power except his own muscles or those of his horse, or the power supplied by wind and water. As these were less powerful than the steam engine, fewer people were concentrated in the early workshops than in later factories. People could work in their own houses, and though they may have worked long hours, they could work to suit themselves. I think that's calling back to, to what you yeah. said a bit earlier there, Hat. You did not have to work on the demands of a boss as such. You worked as you needed to work. Celia Fiennes tells us of the manufacture of Sergis at Exeter in the 17th century. The yarn was made by the spinsters who brought it into the market, where it was bought by the weavers who wove it on their looms. They sold their cloth to the fullers who cleaned it with fuller's earth to remove oil and grease. Fine flowered silks were woven in Canterbury, craps, calamanco, and damasks in Norwich, Norwich stockings in Nottingham, paper in Kent, and so in the 18th century it remained. Let me just uh, mm. resize this window a little bit so people can see the illustrations. Uh, I love that they've got these these little things that they aren't necessarily referenced in the text but are uh, uh, just implements for, for doing things in regular life. Wooden yeah. scoop, rattle for scaring rooks from collection. <laughs> You don't want the birds to eat your crops, do you? No, but you, and you also don't want to spend your day shouting at them, so you've got this great yeah. rattle that you can use, uh, mm. which of course became um, children's toys as well, miniature versions yeah. of those. Rattles. Uh, wooden feeding troughs, that sort of thing. Uh, and if I am, I'm hoping, if my mouse will oblige, that the next page will have... Yes, um, I like this, this particular drawing on the top left here, figure eight. A well-made yeah. implement <laughs> doesn't have a, well implement. doesn't have any greater description than this. I'm assuming it's, it's just a, a well-made implement. I'm assuming it's a form of rake or something to that effect. But uh, you know, pretty amazing. Just going to uh, double check on the chat, see how how people are. People innovation. Are Innovation and such. Richard Crook, innovation now is all gimmicky and wanky, like mobile phone type things, and these chances you see on Dragon's Den. And I think I've only ever seen one successful uh, thing on Dragon's Den, which was the was Levi Roots. the <laughs> reggae reggae sauce, and and he lied, like his entire pitch was a lie. <laughs> he, he said it was his grandmother's recipe, but he'd made it up himself, you know, and that sort of yes. thing. Um, but just goes on <laughs> shows that sort of thing. Yeah, far cry from this. Ah, uh, fabulous. Um, yes, where was I? Uh, yes, okay. So it's important. We'll we'll get onto the negative side of things, I suppose, in in a moment. But it says, you know, they've discussed where everything has been manufactured. There were already industrial towns, but no huge, hideous manufacturing districts hatched in grey as they are on the today on the AA maps as no. places to be avoided. <laughs> friendly bombs and fall on slough. This is fit for humans now. <laughs> we have described the most attractive side of English country life before the Industrial Revolution, but the picture, of course had another side, and if we could go back to 18th century England, we should often be shocked by our contemporaries' morals and manners. <laughs> we should find the people cruel, or think them so. They could see a man hanged and regard it as a morning's amusement, and might, Base. 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 <laughs> and might proceed to explain how, when the man was left hanging, the executioner would pull on his legs to shorten his suffering. <laughs> 
It's just absolutely <laughs> brutal. Well, if, if, if he had to do that, it would mean that he hadn't been hanged uh, according to the proper proper manner. The whole the whole point of hanging somebody properly is that the ro- the rope has to be the exactly correct length, so it snaps their neck immediately, and kills would, them yes. pretty much immediately. Quite a Whereas, complicated business hanging someone. Yes. And it, so if, if he was tugging on his legs to make it quicker, then he hadn't done it properly. Absolutely. In the Woodford Diary, we read that Robert Biggin, great name. <laughs> Biggin? I just, uh, Robert Biggin, B-I-G-G-E-N. Do you think he really was a Biggin? <laughs> I don't know, but he wasn't after the, um... Uh, he wasn't after this. You're gonna, you're gonna love this, okay? Okay. Uh, Robert Biggin, who had been convicted of stealing potatoes, ah, uh, Biggin, <clears throat> over on to you, was whipped through the streets of Cary at a cart's tail by the hangman. The triangular route is detailed, and it sounds a long one. Dear me! Because Robert <laughs> steal potatoes, you greedy git. It goes. It gets even worse. Okay, because Robert was an old offender, right. seventeen shillings and sixpence was collected and given to the hangman to encourage him not to stint his blows. <laughs> oh my god! And here's some extra cash to make it doubly bad. Make sure you make sure. It's like, because he's but, elderly, yeah. just beat him. Or because, <laughs> or because he's offended more than once, beat him. People's surroundings and habits cannot have been very cleanly, or they would not have suffered from diseases engendered by filth. The mortality rate was dreadful. Smallpox, consumption and fevers carried off people in their prime, and only the fittest of the babies survived. So no, no more of these uh, sort of enormous council flat families of no. and infirm people. Goodness. You're gonna have as many kids as you can keep alive, basically. And people did. They tried. Yeah. Um overeating was general and middle aged men were often grossly stout. <laughs> well I mean so basically no- about England then nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> if you survived you were able to uh... North FC, basically. If you survived and made it to middle age, you were you were a- likely to become portly. <laughs> out with beer, yeah. bread, and cheese. Very uh, classic. You know, th- this idea that everyone looked like um, you know the characters in some kind of Viking fan fiction where everyone's yeah. shredded. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> everyone's a portly unit. Now we must return to the opening stages of the Industrial Revolution, and we would suggest oh, no. that this revolution was launched not by James Watt with his steam engine in 1765, but by Jethro Tull with his drill at the very beginning of the century. Deep drill. It was Tull who provided the means of increasing England's food supply, which tended to encourage the growth of population, and without a rising birth rate, there would not have been the labour force to be employed in tending James Watt's new engine. Mm. Jethro Tull was born in Basildon, Berkshire, in 1674 and lived until 1741. He matriculated from St. John's College, Oxford, on July 7th, 1691, when he became... Uh, so he's aged 30. Uh, sorry, um... How old was he there? 1674 to, seven, uh, to 1691. So he was 17. 17, yeah. About, about, about the usual age back then. There you go. Where he became a law student at Gray's Inn, London. And on May 19th, 1699, he was called to the bar. He married on October 26th, 1699. This sounds like the early history of a Lord Chancellor and not that of the man who was to revolutionise farming. And here it is interesting to note how often revolutionary work is done in England by the amateur. Yes, this is a very major topic because most of the great innovations in history, especially in the United Kingdom, have not been by like professionals in labs, but by just, you know, blokes just hanging around in the shed. The tinkerer. Tinkering and bodging and just coming up with great, great discoveries, you know. And uh, and you can imagine why as well, because for a lot of these people entrenched in the agricultural life, aside from all of the societal um, 
pressure is the wrong word, but expectation, I suppose, of how you were to live your life and what has been good enough for your father is good enough for you, um, and the difficulties in experimentation, um, of why it would be uh, necessary, I suppose, for someone to come in and observe something which, even if others have observed it, they haven't had the means or the... Um, uh, the wherewithal, I suppose, to innovate in it, um, mm. especially given, as we mentioned before, if, if societal need is calculated down to a pat of butter, the carpenter is not going to cut down more trees so you can create different projects on the side. Yes. Um, you, you have to come in and commission these things yourself properly. The average Englishman is critical and cantankerous and does better work on his own account than if he is working in a team. I love this sentence so much. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Fabulous. The Industrial Revolution was largely the work of amateurs who kicked against the pricks of established custom and authority. <laughs> Tull's opportunity seems to have come to him more or less by accident. His health was poor. In the preface to his book, he informs us that almost all my life has been a continued sickness. So he left London and returned yeah, to the country, Ill. Ill. whence he came, and returning home with a seeing eye, took stock of the agricultural situation. The land he discovered was still being cultivated by old-fashioned methods that we have described on page 17, and such methods he felt required immediate alteration. Yes. Other people must have felt this too, for although Tull was to meet with much opposition and receive little in the way of thanks, his ideas were recognised as good, and gradually they gained ground. Now, you can see this image on the on the top right, that Tull did not just develop uh, a seed drill off the bat, he first started by designing ploughs. Um, and again, uh, just referencing back to the, the preface, this is a book for children. This, this idea of everything, every single piece of this plough is named with the proper notation and uh, is described in this book, yes. uh, especially in, in its operation. And you just go, wow, okay. Um, yes. and, and exactly what it should look like. You can see the A and the B in the, in the bottom right of the image here, where it shows what the ground is supposed to look like once the plough moves over it. But yes, this is Jethro Tull's common two-wheeled plough. His main idea is expressed in the title to his book. You're going to love the title of this book, um, Hat, because it is one, two, three, four, five and a half lines long. Okay. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, I will read it out if you put it on the screen. Uh, I tell you what, I'll do it. I'll do it here. The Horse Hoeing Husbandry, or an essay on the principles of tillage and vegetation, wherein is shown a method of introducing a sort of vineyard culture into the cornfields in order to increase their product and diminish the common expense by the use of instruments described in cuts. So, <laughs> Happy. Yeah. You know exactly what you're getting when you buy that. Very book. good. <laughs> It should be noticed that Tull places the principles of tillage first, and on these he did his most useful work. The instruments he describes come second. His book was not published until 1733. Tull seems to have started farming soon after his marriage. There you go, women being the, the driving force. Yes. And imagine, this is a sickly man. This is a sickly man, and he's he's going out to do agriculture. He, uh, he he's not gonna he's not gonna waste his life. This is clearly a brainy, a brainy educated man. You know, gra graduate of Oxford, St John's College. Uh, you know, he's he's gonna he's gonna he he's got an autistic obsession with uh, with farming and machinery, and by God, he's gonna get out there and do it. Damn straight. Doesn't matter if he's ill. You know? <laughs> In, you know, being ill didn't stop John Keats from writing his masterpieces, did it? Absolutely didn't not. Didn't stop uh, Gout, didn't stop Johnson from compiling his dictionary. You know, he you did, you just had to get on with it. Absolutely. Tull seems to uh, have invented his first drill about 1701, before he had studied the vineyards on his travels, uh, before he had studied vineyards on his travels between 1711 and 1714. Let us consider first the disadvantages of the old system, which was called sowing broadcast. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a very wasteful uh, when it came to the seed. Yeah. It was very difficult, Tull writes, to find a man that could sow clover tolerably. They had a habit from which they could not be driven, to throw it once with the hand to two large strides and go twice on each cast, thus with nine or ten pounds of seed to an acre. Two thirds of the ground was unplanted, and on the rest it was so thick that it did not prosper. So Tull, mm. and you, can, you can understand why as well, but it's interesting to see how traditions were not necessarily all um, sort of perfect or anything like that, but they, they worked enough for the communities at the size they were, um, and they had enough seed to make it happen, because obviously yeah. plants produce a lot more seed than, you know, than they themselves are. Um, so there we go. So Tull made his first drill, which performed the same task, with two pounds of seed instead of nine or ten. As early as 1701, he also used his drill for wheat, making the channels a one-foot distance at a cost of six pence, the acre, only using one bushel of seed to the acre. And you can imagine that this actually made people take notice. <laughs> yeah. It's like, my God. I've just yeah. I've reduced your costs for seeding the ground to 20% of what they were. <laughs> so that's going to make people, wow. no, yeah. matter, no matter how um, uh, stuck in your ways you are, you might look at that with some they interest. They will sit, sit up and pay attention all of a sudden. Hmm. Mr. Tull. Here were the important facts that could not be overlooked by Tull's neighbours. He not only saved seed, but by sowing the seeds in drills, that being limes, he made it possible for the weeds to be kept down by hoeing and for the ground to be cultivated and kept friable far more simply and economically than when the crop crops sprang up at random. Yes. We must remember that, besides inventing his drill, Tull initiated good cultivation. But the farmer is the most conservative of men. And as his book hints, Tull suffered the common fate of innovators. Instead of the acclamation he expected, he heard constant grumbles. <laughs> I, to be fair, I, I do sympathise with the farmers because I think of myself as basically an indignant peasant who just wants to keep doing things the way, the way they're going. And it's like, oh, but look, my new drill reduces costs by 20%. Just just let me get on with it. You know, I've got work to do. Yeah. I want to just get on with this. Uh, like It works fine as it is. Just go away, Tull. You know. Yeah, you, you'll love this. That no doubt his neighbours complained about amongst themselves of this lawyer of all persons Drilling seed with a machine? Why could not the man be satisfied with the ways of his father? And so on and so forth. Exactly. If it worked for my daddy, it'll work for me. And so on and so on. But Tull persisted, and today he must be reckoned as one of the makers of modern England. That being 1950s England. <laughs> Mm. We are running on, however, a little too quickly, and we will follow Tull's example and start with the plough, or plough, as he calls it. So it, he, when he's uh, there's two spellings here. So plough is in P L O U G H, and plough as he's written it P L O W. And you wonder whether or not there was a different pronunciation there, but I'm not. I'm not going to assume it was called a plough. It doesn't no. doesn't make sense <laughs> to me, you know. Um, but presumably he changed the changed the way in which uh, it was written about commonly at least uh, ch -ch 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 yes he shows the first common two-wheeled plough used in Berkshire Berkshire um, Hampshire Oxfordshire and Wiltshire and most other counties of southern Britain except where they were miry clays which clogged the wheels in heavy land the swing plough which is this uh, uh, rather fanciful looking instrument on the top left here uh, with a more horizontal beam and no wheels was used it's interesting to note that a wheeled plough shows up in the Norman Bayou tapestry and a swing plough in the 14th century littoral Psalter I have no idea what the littoral Psalter is no I'd have to look into it whether or not that makes me dreadfully ignorant, but it's clearly assumed that the child reading this would know what it is. So uh, I quite like that. The function of the plough is to break up land that has been under grass or lying fallow, and it works as follows. If we refer to figure 10, so that being 
our two-wheeled plough here. I shall pop that up again, which shows Tull's common plough. We shall see the coulter makes the vertical cut and the share the horizontal one. The depth of the furrow, about seven inches, is regulated by raising or lowering the beam on its pillow. With a swing plough, the ploughman does this by raising up and bearing down on the plough handles. The furrow slice is turned over by the earth board. In the ordinary way, a ploughman does not plough up and down the field with the furrow side by side, but moves across the headland by the hedge until the furrow slices lie in the direction of A in figure 10. So right. it, it is super technical, this. Um, yes, it is. And I will, I will read the technical stuff uh, as it goes, because they're not too lengthy. And I just think it's, it's quite interesting in its own way, the kinds of knowledge that you were expected to know uh, even even at a very young age and know exactly where all of these things are taking place um, mm. and how they're taking place as well, which is a far cry from like, you know, the, the, the education I had historically on, I don't know, like what it was like to be a peasant girl in the Middle Ages during the Black Death. You know, it, doesn't, it didn't have the same kind of, um, it was quite interesting, but it didn't have the same depth, the same kind of detail. Uh -huh. Where the slice is inclined towards one another comes the ridge, and where they go from one another, the water furrow used for drainage. Drainage. The distance between these furrows depends on the character of the soil and its need for drainage. And again, these things were expected. One of the problems with which the farmer has to contend, I shall uh, just admire this, this poor man who has to operate this breast plow in figure 12 here on the right hand page. Uh, before Tull's invention, can you imagine having to do to plow an entire field by hand using this, having to bear down on it the entire time as well? Yes, yes. Hence, why it's a breast plow because you literally push your entire chest Pretty into it. Down on it. Yeah, God Almighty. Goodness. I mean, it did, didn't exactly make the work easier per se. Uh... Sorry. It, it didn't exactly make make the work easier per se. No, it just and, not physically easier, and certainly less uh, less straight lines. As it were. Yeah. Uh, having to deal with weeds is important. So in in Figure Ten, which is our, our older two wheel plow, do um, in fact, I'll pop it back just because I don't want people jumping back and forth in the video. We've got our two wheel plow here again, um, and. Yes, so the furrow slices upside down after ploughing, and if the weather favours favors them, the weeds will soon grow up again between the slices. Tull points out that another way to conquer strong turf is to plough it first with the breast plough very thinly, but this is a very expensive proceeding. In the later plough, there is an ingenious little share in front of the coulter, which skimmed off weeds and turned them over to be buried under the furrow slice by the action of the earth board. It was to solve this problem that Tull invented his four coulted plough. And I'm going to just uh, bring this on to, to that picture, which is even yeah. more detailed here. Incredible. I just imagine some, some nine-year-old just, just delving into this. And just uh, <laughs> a feast for the eyes, shall we say. If you've got nothing else to do, you could go and you can learn all about Tull's four coulted plough. <laughs> exactly. You can hear, exactly. You can imagine the indignation of his fellow farmers and almost hear them demanding, who ever heard of a four coulted plough? The beam had to be made... <laughs> <laughs> Just the indignant farmers standing by the side of the field watching this man tinker with his you know, yeah. enormous invention here. The beam had to be made longer to accommodate three additional coulters, which were placed, each of them, two and a half inches to the right of the one behind, and the points of the three in front were kept up somewhat higher than the one in front of the share. This made the vertical cut, which cut off the furrow slice, ten inches wide, but when it had been severed by the share and turned over by the earth board, the slice had three vertical cuts in it made by the other coulters, so that the mm. roots of grass and weeds were much more easily dried and destroyed and the ground made more friable. We have marked Tull's interesting old names for the various parts of the plough on our drawings. Okay, that's the end of our technical section for that, I suppose. Okay. The land having been prepared by ploughing and harrowing, we can consider the drilling that followed with the help of Tull's great invention, 
a mighty invention since it enabled men to increase their stock of food and, like most inventions, it may now seem simple enough. Does it seem simple, Hat? Does it seem um, simple so far? Comparatively, given given innovations in agriculture since then, yes, it's a relative... I mean, the, the, the thing is, the idea is simple enough. Um... But the the mechanics of making this in the 1700s are incredible. Like I think, I think as it said in the book, remember there was no steam power. All you had was muscle power or wind power, basically. Um, either a man had to do it or a horse had to do it, and that was basically all you had for farming. So to be able to come up with a machine that, by muscle power, is inventive enough to drill seed holes in the ground regularly and, and reliably, really is quite something. Um, the idea is simple, but the execution is complex. Indeed. And the book itself says, The inventor's chief merit lies in first conceiving the idea. Um, and indeed, in communicating mm. it, because he would have had to go to the carpenter, he would have had to have gone to the smith and had these things made. So, mm. very um, clearly, clearly a man able to communicate himself. Yes. The function of Toll's drill was to make the channels, sow the seeds, and cover the rows all in one operation. The principal parts of this drill were the seed box, hopper, plough, and harrow. Of these, Tull explains the seed box is the chief. It measures, or rather numbers, out the seed, which it receives from the hopper. It is for this purpose as an artificial hand, which performs the task of delivering out the seed more equally than can be done by the natural hand. Um... We will begin then with the seed box, and here Tull's book is particularly interesting, for he tells us just how he went to work in designing his drill. Some of our younger readers may be ambitious to invent, and yet doubt whether they have the ne necessary talent. Mm. Tull will give them comfort. Great ideas, his example demonstrates, do not spring from the head fully armed as an Athene sprang from the brow of Zeus. Wow. <laughs> Let's see if the ten-year-olds get the classical reference. Happy well, I mean, they would, because they would have been taught classics from about age five, so... Of course, but not necessarily um, Greek myth, I suppose, or Athene and, and Zeus and that sort of thing, but... Um, they, would have, they, they, they would have known um, Greek myth, they would have been taught Latin and Greek uh, languages as well, and one of the ways in which you learn those is that you, you translate ancient stories and poems. Mm. Into English. Oh yes, that was very common, wasn't it? And part of learning languages mainly as well. You would often I, I had to do that. Mm. Mm. I had to translate, translate entire, uh, <laughs> entire parts of the bloody <laughs> Catalina, <laughs> Catalina orations and Caesar. You know. Goodness. Uh, uh, Tull, it's Tull, it's anyway. <laughs> Tull continues, Happy accident plays a great part in invention and the ability to see that adaptation may be useful. Confronted with the problem of the seat box that was to take the place of the hand, Tull thought of what he calls the tongue and what modern organ builders call the palate. Because of course they do. Yes. In the soundboard of an organ. Yes, so what he called the tongue in the soundboard of an organ. He had learned to play the organ when he was young, and must have taken it to pieces, one hopes with the consent of his parents. <laughs> For he seems thoroughly to have understood its mechanism. We have reconstructed this in figure 14, which is the, uh, the organ palette here on the right-hand page. Odd information yes. is sometimes very useful, and in the organ there may be some further ideas for inventors. In the smaller diagram, A... So that's this uh, this tiny little bit at the bottom here, which shows a, a side view of the tongue itself. Uh, in a small diagram A, it shows how when the playing end of the key is depressed, the other rises because the key is depressed pivoted on its centre, and how by a series of rods the tongue at C is opened and lets compressed air provided by the bellows from a continuous chamber at B into a series of grooves or mortises at D, on the top of which comes from the feet of the pipes. There is a groove for each key on the keyboard, each with its own tongue, and the grooves will vary in width to suit the sizes of the pipes. But Tull points out that the tongue shuts flat among the, against the surface of the groove and is kept in position by the spring shown. This was practical for measuring out the air to be let in by the pipes, but clearly you could not measure out wheat in this way since it would get jammed in between the tongue and its seating. 
Tull's next step was to design his seed box in brass in two halves, bolted together, and made wider at the bottom than at the top to prevent what Tull calls the arching or jamming of the seed in the box. So he's had to, he's had to innovate here. Yes. Figure 16 shows the drill itself, which made channels for a treble row of wheat at seven inch partitions. So let me just get that up for people to read and see. Um, there it is, figure 15, figure 15, that's a seed box. And figure 16, again, this, uh, on, a, on a, the angle here, let me just transform yes. that. And flip counterclockwise, no, I wanted to go clockwise. 180 degrees. There we go. So you can see it, it's it's gone on quite a complicated way from his uh, from his plow, but uh, done doing good work there. Uh, there we go. Okay. Figure 16 shows the drill itself, which made channels for a treble row of wheat at seven inch partitions. We can now quote Tull's summing up of his inventions. The first idea that I formed of this machine was thus. I imagined the mortise or groove brought from the soundboard of an organ, together with the tongue and spring, all of them much altered. The mortise having a hole therein, and put on what put on upon one of the iron gudgeons of the wheelbarrow, which gudgeon being enlarged to an inch and a half diameter, having on it the notches of the cylinder of a cider mill, on that part of it which should be within the mortise. And this mortise made in the ear of the wheelbarrow, through which the gudgeon usually passes, made broad enough for the purpose, this I hoped for anything I saw to the contrary might perform this work of drilling, and herein I was not deceived. Well, <laughs> it's just, I mean, I can't really add to that. No, <laughs> quite intense, quite intense. Tull goes on to remark that placing a box over the mortise to carry the seed was so obvious a device as to demand little thought. Nor did it tax his ingenuity to place the spindle on two wheels, one at each end, instead of on one, as with a wheelbarrow, or contrive the plough instead to make the channels. At first the channels were left open and the seed were covered by a harrow, then this was added to the drill and the whole task done in a single operation. Our description of Tull's famous drill is considerably less lengthy than that of the designer. Uh, one description... Uh, in the 1733 edition of Tull's book, he devotes 12,662 words to describing the seed box alone before he starts on the rest of the machine. He, he had to be exhaustive, didn't he? He had to know exactly uh, what he was saying. Oh, 100%. Um, it is heavy reading, but very well worth the time and trouble. And you can imagine... Fantastic. Being the inventor of such a machine, it's better to be verbose than concise, I suppose. Mm. How are you finding our little jaunt into the uh, 18th century here, Hat? I'm finding it most relaxing. I'm sitting back uh, in my chair, with surrounded by cushions, and I've got a nice throw, wheat sort of wool blanket over me. You know, there's, the rain is pitter-pattering outside. And uh, here I am looking at this wonderful history of the Jethro Tull's machines and fine discussion and everything. <laughs> everything is right with the world. My, my only complaint is that I'm nearly out of tea and I may have to go and put the kettle on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, somehow I'm very much enjoying this. Very, it's a lovely wind down from the uh, T.S. Eliot stream I was on uh, just now, which Mr. was, you know, very intense and you know, brain draining. Mr. D, an intense person, surely not. <laughs> No, I'm enjoying this very much. I, I like it. I like any stream that's just a cozy, chill conversation about something. Well, I hope this is the... honestly. I, I know a lot of people that follow me do so because this is according to them, not according to me. Mm -hmm. I I have a voice that is nice to fall asleep to or to have on in the in the background, yeah. and um, lots of people apparently watch my channel for that reason because they just like to have the videos on. You and you're... Uh, sorry. You'll get to a point where it's weird because people uh, have said the same thing to myself. They enjoy listening to things that I say and falling asleep to them. I was once told by a woman that she enjoyed listening to me in the shower. For, <laughs> oh, uh. Uh, you know, for, for whatever purpose that may be. <laughs> I say, <clears throat> well, I haven't had anybody say that yet. But, no. Uh... You'll, it'll come, Mr. Hatt. It'll come. 
I hope I'm sure, people... I'm sure I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Mrs. Hat will have words for them. <laughs> I hope that, uh, well, she knows, you know, of course, uh, the dogs can chase the cars, but they may never catch them. Yes, yes. So there you go. I hope that everyone else is enjoying uh, is enjoying the stream as well, uh, just as a, a bit of lightly getting it back into the kind of uh, the stream atmosphere. I will do a more, uh, shall we say, up-to-date, I suppose, um, political... Uh, rundown of things, uh, sort of similar to Fake Accents Unite when that was still running. Uh, I don't think Fake Accents Unite will return, by the way, um, and I won't uh, necessarily go into into why. But um, suffice it to say, me and the British are not on bad terms, and uh, and all is well there. But it it felt like a natural time to end the show for various reasons I behind the scenes. Welcome back to Fake Accents Unite with me, the British. Are you going to be my new Britisher hat? That's the question. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's return to the world of Jethro Tull and his 13,000-word treatise on the seed box. <laughs> yes, indeed. It Back is, to it. Back to it. It is heavy reading, but very oh, I may, well. I, I, may, I may take a chance, just while we're sort of uh, in the middle here, to of nip, nip off and put, put the kettle on and refresh myself and come back. Very, very I'll, well. I'll be very quick. I'll be, I'll be only a few minutes. You should. All right, I shall, I shall continue reading to the audience, I suppose. All right, very good. It is heavy reading, this being Tull's uh, description, but very well worth the time and trouble. After all, it was a great achievement to take parts of an organ, a wheelbarrow, and a cider mill, adapt and alter and combine them into one of the most useful implements of agriculture. There is hope for us all in this direction. Tull saw to the root of the matter, when he reminded us that some waste their whole lives in studying how to arm death. In fact, I'm going to save this for Hat because this is a, a fantastic little little passage. But um, I hope that you are all well in the audience. I hope that you're enjoying this. Uh, I'm very happy to be back. I took a break from streaming, I suppose, um, with the end of Fake Accents Unite. I wasn't entirely sure. Uh, the direction I wanted to take the channel. Uh, I went through a period of very prolonged, um, I won't say lethargy, but a, a lack of inspiration. Uh, everything that I saw in the modern world was dull and uninteresting, uh, including things like the, <laughs> the burgeoning propaganda war over Ukraine, various things. Covid had been basically the only discussion point in uh, in in politics for two years, really of note. I mean, uh, various bits and pieces on uh, Trump and Biden and all sorts. Um, but recently, I've I found myself considering again some of the great, uh, I suppose, problems of our, our modern age. I'm really looking forward. I have two videos. Uh, one is fully scripted, uh, and one has yet to be fully scripted. Uh, which I think is going to be a bit more of an effort. Uh, the first one is on, uh, the unscripted one is on diversity and uh, basically uh, the, the function of diversity and its uselessness as a descriptor in, in the modern world and, and various other uh, bits and pieces on that. Uh, various bits of, I guess, a, a psychological perspective on things, but also a, a human perspective and, uh, and stuff like that. And then I also have another one, which is escaping me for the time being, but I'm assuming is, it was on my regular account, but anyway, I have another video, uh, which is coming uh, as well, slightly later on, which I did script the whole thing over the course of a morning, and it is frustrating me uncensored timeline no okay so I, I will I will keep that under wraps for the time being but I the exact wording is escaping me it's late in the evening you must forgive me but there we go so I have I have two videos that I would like to make which are in the in the works just need to reacquaint myself with Sony Vegas uh, 19 and try and make it the best and most interesting videos that I can but very much looking forward to, to bringing that to you people. So 
should be good. I uh, appreciate that History Debunked has a great video about diversity today, Craig, but I'm trying to uh, keep it my own video, you know, I don't want to rehash necessarily what someone else has said. If it ends up being that we say many of the same things, that would be great, but, um, uh, you know, we're in tune or whatever, but if uh, hopefully I can bring something of uh, a unique perspective to it as well. Florida man and Elon showed up, yes, Elon Musk and his takeover of Twitter. Uh, it's interesting to me from a point of view of who Elon is playing to. I ran a poll on Twitter recently which talked about, uh, which asked people, do they trust Elon Musk? Most people were undecided and then the others were split 50-50 between yes and no. Um, and obviously observing the various tweets he's made to play to, uh, I guess, a more conservative, small-c conservative audience. Uh, especially American small C conservative audience has been it's been really interesting to observe. I still don't trust him myself. Um, he has his own goals and uh, ideas, of course, but I'm looking forward to seeing kind of how spaces change because it's a big shakeup. So, so there's that. I suppose back to back to Jethro Troll. Yes, are you back, Mister Hat? He says no rank punditry. <laughs> He's not yet back, but if he can hear me, then I shall I shall continue reading because uh, the part that I wanted to to read to him uh, will go in. There is hope for us all in this direction. Uh, so okay, I'll read from the beginning of the paragraph. After all, it was a great in achievement to take parts of an organ, wheelbarrow, and cider mill, and alter and adapt and combine them into one of the most useful implements of agriculture. There is hope for us all in this direction. Tull saw to the root of the matter when he reminded us that some waste their whole lives in studying how to arm death with new engines of horror and inventing an infinite variety of slaughter, but think it beneath men of learning who, are only, who only are capable of doing it to employ their learned labours in the invention of new or even improving the old instruments for increasing of bread. I just think that's a really beautiful um, kind of summary of, of what it is. And I can only think of how many people now waste their lives uh, pursuing things which are not intrinsic to the human condition. And uh, some would say that it is, um, you know, that's a, human endeavors can go in many different directions. But I think that um, finding ways to improve localism uh, and, and improve the ways in which we perform localism is very valid uh, in my mind. William Cobbett, of whom we shall have more to say presently, gave Tull the credit for inventing the first drill. If its effect, if its effect, this was the increasing of bread and an increase of the population followed. I think that's a, a typo there. Tull may indeed, uh, oh, if its, effect, if its effect was the increasing of bread and an increasing of the population followed, Tull may indeed be regarded as one of the makers of modern England. When men were hunters of the old stone age, the factor that decided the number of the hunters was the area necessary to support and feed the animals that they hunted. During the new stone age, men caught animals and tended them as herdsmen, and began to grow crops to feed both the animals and themselves, so that the land could support a larger population. The extraordinary thing is that from the New Stone Age up to the advent of Tull, there was not any very real or essential change. The system of farming that we described on page 17 was really very primitive, just sufficient, was grown to keep the people alive, allowing for remarkably little margin. When the winter came, there was only hay to feed the cattle on, and many of them were killed and salted down. There was no possibility of increasing flocks and herds. If a summer turned out to be bad and the hay crop failed, the herds starved. It was this fact that made early landowners so insistent on the game laws. They were pot hunters and chased the wild deer and hare and shot the pheasant and the partridge because game provided fresh meat in the winter 
and afforded a pleasant change from salted meat. The large pigeon coats, or cots, that can still be found were built for exactly the same reason. A plump pigeon in a pie was prettier eating than pickled pork. The winter shortage of fresh meat also explains why Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. He was doing so in an attempt to make pickled pork palatable. Tull did more good work by inventing a special turnip drill. As far as I can be informed, he writes, tis but of late years that turnips have been introduced as an improvement in the field. And again, the greatest turnip improvement used by the farmer is for his cattle in the winter. The turnip, of course, had been known as a garden vegetable long before this time. It may be that a flock of sheep cropping the scanty herbage of a winter field raided a farmer's garden and ate off all the turnips. The farmer, they then may, the farmer then may well have thought, why not grow the turnips on a large scale in a field and let sheep eat them there? To regulate their munching and not let them spoil the whole field, we will move them along in enclosures made by hurdles. This was first done in Suffolk around 1724. It sounds so simple a plan, yet it had occurred to nobody at an earlier period. It was destined, nevertheless, to be revolutionary. Other stock could be fed on turnips, which meant not only more meat, but more milk and butter, and what was just as important, more manure. By 1724, Tull had already shown the farmers how to grow more corn. More corn produced more straw. The straw could be placed in the yards and there turned into manure, which would not only improve impoverished old soils, but enable new light ones to be brought into cultivation. It is often asserted that enclosures were necessary to meet the demand for food from an increasing industrial population, but there would not have been an industrial population had it not been for the work of Tull. We shall here have something to say about the Enclosure Acts presently, but here we would like to point out that enclosing the land did not reclaim it. Planting quickset hedges does not make corn grow. The enclosures followed as a natural result of agricultural changes that Jethro Tull had brought about. And there we come to the end of, uh, of Jethro Tull, I suppose. Wonderful. So, yeah, it's... Uh... I, I didn't mean wonderful because we came to the end. I, mean, I, mean, <laughs> I enjoyed the very much, but yes. I think it's a, it's a, a truly a fascinating snippet into, into this very early page. We I mean, all... he's, he's, he's one of these truly great, just archetypical B Britons. I mean, this sort of like, you know, this fella that just, you know, goes to uni, slums around Oxford for a bit, uh, and then decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to completely reinvent ag agriculture as we know it by <laughs> bodging around in, in a shed, and then he comes and does it. Um, just before I forget, someone called, uh, I think it's Mio Yuori in the chat, says, any advice for going deeper into poetry for a neophyte that liked Lady of Shalott but found the deep streams of TOS too much, uh, of TS too much? Um, well, yeah, so you like Lady of, of Shalott, which I presumably I mean, I, I think you mean the Tennyson poem. Um, I would say in that case, read into Tennyson. Um, if you haven't read Kipling, that's an excellent place to start. His kind of uh, bouncy ballad meters are wonderful to read. Um, I'm going to do a reading of um, his poem, which has the immortal line, um, For a woman is only a woman, but a good cigar is a smoke. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do a reading of that. Fantastic. Um, yes, I mean, any of the late, late Victorians, you could go earlier, you could go with the Romantics, have you read Keats and Shelley and Byron and all that sort of thing. Um, the Edwardian Georgian poets, the, the the Catholic poetry of Chesterton and Belloc is wonderful. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I'd say since since you like Lady of Shalott, if, if that's your, your your first step into into poetry, then that's where you need to start. Um, look, look into that sort of stuff and uh, subscribe to my channel for po for poetry. <laughs> That'll be more of it coming. Absolutely shameless. <laughs> to throw it in there. All right. Anyway. Sorry, I just wanted to answer that before I forgot to do it. We are on page uh, 33 now. We shall go to page 40 today. Wonderful. Uh, which will um, lead to the end of the section on farming. Tea, so, tea update, but, but, by the way. Yes. Um, having a delicious brew of, uh, of uh, Earl Grey from a company called Ahmed Teas, who are uh, <laughs> a couple of uh, prosperous brothers from, the, from certain parts of the world came 
and um, and uh, founded a, a very good tea company in London, which is still there now, and I, I recommend it. Um, unfortunately, I did have some uh, Kenya loose leaf, which is my probably my my my, my favourite black tea. Uh, no 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 bias uh, <laughs> whatsoever there. Um, and uh, I, unfortunately, I'd, I'd run out of that, so I'm back to the bagged tea. But uh, but it's still very good. It's still very good. Now having with it a ginger nut, uh, a lovely ginger nut biscuit. Good hardy um, British fare, that, uh, that yes, ginger indeed. nut. I uh, I myself had a, a pint of uh, Lady Grey earlier, just as a, a nice fruity finish. And um, I like I like a dash of orange with tea. It suits it very well. Mmm, flavory fruity teas. Wonderful things. Wonderful things. We're going to hear about um, Charles Townshend now. Do you know anything about Char- Charles Townshend? Charles Townshend. Well, is this turnip turnip Townshend? Yes. Turnip yes. Townshend. And this, he was he was also prime minister, wasn't he? Was he? I know I, he was. I, I, this is a different Charles Townshend. Hang on. Uh, Charles. Charles Townshend, or Townsend, I think we He was a Viscount, the second Viscount Townshend. Uh, Charles Townshend. Um, a British politician. Am I looking at a different one here? And he he was instrumental in the in the War of Independence, uh, the, the protests of the War of Independence. I don't yeah. think this is him. No, I'm looking at a different possibly. Charles Townshend. Well, I shall uh, I shall read of this Charles Townshend now, just in the interest of time. Turnip Townshend. Sorry, just to check. Yeah, second Viscount Townshend, much much earlier. Uh, probably related to the other town, Townshend. Possibly. Um, Charles Charles anyways. Townshend, the second Viscount Townshend, is another great name, an enthusiast who carried on agricultural experiments at Raynham, his Norfolk country house, in 1730. He was nicknamed Turnip Townshend by London Wits because Turnip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was nicknamed Turnip Townshend by London Wits because Turnip headed themselves. They were amused by his unselfish devotion to the cause of agriculture. Just Wonderful. <laughs> the absolute shade. Being so so being, be, be, being a turnip head is like being a petrol head and you're interested in cars, I imagine. Right? No, be, be, being, uh, being turnip headed is an insult. Uh, oh, to to right. be uh, the the um, the forage only fit for animal consumption. It's like you, you know the the original yeah. original word for calling someone a bit of a shithead. You know that sort of thing. <laughs> Turn it bad. So there we go. Pope tells us that a favourite subject of Townshend's conversation was that kind of rural improvement which arises from turnips. I love him. I love this man already. Townshend is also credited with the introduction of the Norfolk f- or four-course system of cultivation. The fields were cropped in the following rotation. Wheat or oats sown in the winter. Then the next year, oats or barley sown in the spring. The third year, clover, rye, vetches, swedes and kale for winter feed. And for the fourth year, turnips. The sheep. Yeah, were- that's right. <laughs> yeah. The sheep were then hurdled over the turnips and manured the ground so that it was ready for wheat the next year. The four-core system has lasted until today, when the land is being put down to grass and the wise farmer grows meat, milk and poultry. Um, Yes, so a bit of background on this kind of thing. So anyone who knows anything about agriculture will know that you can't just grow... So in in Western-style agriculture, you can't just grow one crop in place forever. No. Um, because it will wear out the soil, basically. All the nutrients that particular crop needs will be worn out and the soil will become basically barren. Um, so what you so, so this is the difference really between a farm and a plantation, for example. So a plantation in a, in a, in a hot country, you could just grow sugar or tea or cotton or whatever over and over and over again, generally. This is a generally now. There are exceptions to this. And get away with it. But if, if, you, if you're going to grow corn, if you're going to grow veg, if you're going to grow... Um, uh, Western sort of style gr- grains and things, then you need to you need to you need to ro- rotate them. So you have let's say you have three fields, and you have wheat in one field, um, I don't know millet or something in the other, um, and uh, 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 like I don't know veg, ca- 
cabbage or something, something in, in the other field or anything. What you do is each each season or each growth, you rotate you rotate them around. So you move your cabbages into the other field, grain into the other field, millet into the other field. So you keep you keep circling round. And I believe that Turnip Townsend was um, he was he was a proponent of the four field crop system. The idea that that you grow four different crops in a cycle. Um, yes. In order to in order to <clears throat> Uh, to 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 to, ma- to maintain the the efficiency of the farm and the and the quality of the soil, I believe I may have got some of that wrong because I'm not a grower myself, but I did grow up around lots of farms. So. Yes, and crop rotation was it's very important. I mean, it's mainly because a lot of the plants that we grow because we have uh, less sunlight here, mm-hmm. uh, the plants take a lot of their nutrients out of the soil, and so you yes. need to replenish them over time. Um. But yes, so the next important name to be mentioned is that of Bakewell, a farmer of Dishley near Loughborough, Leicestershire, born in 1725. He concentrated his attention on the impoverishment, uh, improvement sorry, of cattle. Before his time, they had been leggy beasts who wandered about over the common fields after harvest or were driven on to the waste to pick up a living as best they could. Sheep were more valued for their golden fleece than for the mutton they produced. Bakewell started his experiments around 1745 and, by carefully selecting the animals from which he bred, produced far more meat per animal than had been done before. Don't just, yes. let, don't just let your rams do ramming. <laughs> so, no, you have to be selective, selective breeding. And uh, Tull had already produced the bread, and when Bakewell added the meat, times were ripe for the increase in the population that were to produce the Industrial Revolution, which right. itself would turn out manufactured goods for the empire overseas. Next, we come to Thomas Coke of Holcomb. Coke came into his estate in 1776. And Americans in the chat go, <laughs> And, they, oh, yeah. and there carried on to the experiments that were to raise his rent roll from two thousand two hundred pounds in seventeen seventy six to twenty thousand pounds in eighteen sixteen. That is one hell of a rent roll. That I mean, the rent on his tenants. Yeah. He carried on Townshend's good work and adopted the principle: no fodder, no beasts, no beasts, no manure, no manure, no crop. Coke must have been a pleasant man. It was in 1778 that he started at his home the Meetings of Farmers, afterwards held annually, which became known as the Holcomb Meetings. I love that. That's really uh, like a nice uh, community hub, as it were. And we can see here, I'm just uh, again going to rotate this image. We can see lively activity on an 18th century farm. And I'm just going to expand that up for people to to gaze at. There we go. Um, Yes, so Holcomb meetings. These were held in a great house built by Coke's ancestor, Lord Leicester. This house, which had begun about 1734 and was not finished for a quarter of a century, Mm. seems to have been inspired by Lord Leicester and his friend, Lord Burlington. I love all these names. Mm. With professional assistance from Kent, but the design was carried out by a Norwich architect, Matthew Brettingham. Although not built by Coke himself, Holcomb well illustrates a great 18th century house, and the 18th was the century of great houses. The chart 2, which I'm assuming... I don't think they have it in the uh, this edition that I have here, so you'll have to just look at this lively activity, I'm afraid. Right. Um, the chart too gives some dates of some of them and must now remain as a source of embarrassment to their impoverished owners. <laughs> <laughs> when they were built, however, they were centres of life and progress. The Holcomb gatherings lasted a week and were attended by hundreds of people from all over the world. Agriculture was recognised as the mother of all crafts and a subject of interest to all. If it's an If an aristocrat like Coke was a good man and leader to his people, he needed a big house in which to entertain his friends. Cobbett spoke well of him in his Rural Rides, which is a book he wrote, where he says that expressions made use of towards him that affectionate children use towards the best of parents. 
That's a, that's a great line, isn't it? I love the pro, the rambling prose of this book. <laughs> Arthur Young was yet another great agricultural pioneer. Born in 1741, he became Secretary of the Board of Agriculture in 93 and died in 1820. He was an enthusiastic advocate for enclosing the common fields and adopting Tullian methods of tillage. Professor S. E. Morrison, writing in The Times on February 22nd, 1932, 200 years after the birth of George Washington, tells us that Washington's greatest teacher and deepest love was the land. He was among Arthur Young's correspondents. How much more delightful, he wrote in one of his letters, is the task of making improvements on the earth than all the vain glory which can be acquired from ravaging it by the most oh, uninterrupted it. career of conquest. Oh, this, this is so base. This is so base. It's incredible. <laughs> and elsewhere, to see plants rise from the earth and flourish by the superior skill and bounty of the labourer fills a contemplative mind with ideas which are more easy to be conceived than expressed. The carrot pill in all its glory. <laughs> oh, this is so. This is what I want. I want the music of angels to accompany this prose. This is incredible. When Washington went to Mount Vernon in 1759, he found that his estate was in bad order and devoted himself to putting things right. He became an eager student of Tull's horse hoeing husbandry, Horn's horse husbandry, yes, the, the book. Yes, Horn's gentleman farmer, and Weston's new system of agriculture with fox hunting as a recreation. I just love that they entered it. They put yeah. that in there at the end. It's great. That's the the correct hobby of a of a country squire is the 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 fox hunt, horse was, and hound. Mm. It was perhaps because of this training that he was able to do his other work so well. This is hardly the place to discuss the technical details of the land enclosure acts, but briefly the principle was to gather the land together in larger holdings on which Tullian methods could be carried out. Without the enclosures, there would have been starvation during the Napoleonic Wars. The drawback of the enclosures was that, was that they dispossessed the smaller man and left him with no stake in his soil. Often he became a hired labourer, and the labourer's position, as we shall see when we get to the beginning of the 19th century, was hard indeed. Yeah. And unfortunate, again, unfortunate that, you know, yeah. It's, it's this interesting change. I mean, e even in, in the modern age, you can see that the people who... People thrive, I suppose, and are not miserable when they can see that the work of their hands and the product that it creates, but also they have a sense of ownership over it. Yeah. So it's it's not... That's, that's what people really need, I think. I mean, the... Like, if you work in a, a Morrison's, right... Ugh, and you and you and you make all the shelves right. You pull all the products to the front, and you get everything out of the warehouse, and you talk to the warehouse staff, and uh, and you've put out the pallets, and you've put everything correct. There's a certain satisfaction in it, but there's no kind of long-term joy really to be found there. Uh, it's. it's so many jobs which are like that, especially the service you're also industry. You're fungible. You're, and you're very replaceable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, like, if, if imagine that your family are, like, I don't know, Lancashire farmers or something, and your father has run your farm, and you grow up on his farm, and he teaches you how to run the farm, how to keep the accounts, everything that needs to be done, how to be competent at it. And then you go on to work that farm yourself, and you and your family continue to run your land and your farm, and you 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 produce food, you produce goods, you produce and children, you, you produce you have a family, and you have your house. And can you imagine the just the basic satisfaction that would come with it with a life like that? I mean, hopefully, some people in the chat here won't have to imagine that's what this the sets have to imagine it. They they can sort of you know they can they can live in that way, and then compare that to going off to the city to just work on a work in a mill or or in some some factory where you're just a, you're just a wagey mm. wagey wagey get in kg <clears throat> i mean there are ways to do it i mean at the moment the modern answer to it seems to be holidays 
Um, <laughs> and I, 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 it sounds stupid, right? And it is, uh, it, like, ultimately unfulfilling. But that's what's being sold to people as, like, mm -hmm. a replacement for long-term growth and development. You're perfect just the way you are, so don't need to develop, except in a career mm -hmm. sense. And if you're going to develop in a career sense, you're, you're kind of either expected to love the job more than life itself, or you're expected to love the benefits that come with that job more than life itself. And it's just profoundly inhuman, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But uh, yes, anyway. In the, in, in, in the picture on screen before you, you see free men. <laughs> I like it. This is hardly the place to discuss the technical details of the Land Enclosure Act. Oh my. Uh, yes, we've already discussed that, sorry. Um, having dealt with the great men and shown how their fortunes were affected by the times, we can now turn to humbler folk. And here we have been helped by the wonderful diary of a country parson. It records the life of Reverend James Woodford, who was born in 1740 and died in 1803. Oh, yes, the Woodford Diaries, yes. Mm -hmm. So the diarist, in the short span of his life, yes, he was only uh, 63 there, saw the mm -hmm. end of the old agricultural England and the foundations laid of the empire and modern industrial England. The diary was edited by the late John Beresford and published by Oxford University Press, and we should like to express our gratitude here for permission to make use of it. So far as we are concerned, the main interest of the diary begins when Woodford is presented to the college living of Weston uh, in Norfolk in 1774. This was supposed to be worth £300 per year. As Woodford was able to lead a very pleasant life at Weston and keep two maids, a footman, a houseboy and a farmhand, we see that money then was worth much more than it is now. Yeah, and also the, the idea of service was worth much more. It must be remembered that Woodford was not only a parson, and a very good one, who cared for the souls of his parishioners, but a practical farmer, farming his own, uh, it says glebe here, G-L-E-B-E, -E, I'm not entirely sure what that is. Mm -hmm. When the farmers who paid him tithe came to the tithe frolics, we may have, uh, we may be sure that he and they had much in common, and that like Townshend they could discuss that kind of rural improvement which arises from turnips. <laughs> Wonderful. He was assisted in his farming by the faithful Benjamin Leggett, whom he engaged in September 1776 as farmhand at £10 per year. Ben living at the Parsonage House. Ben was helped by one of the maids who did the milking, and the footman and the boy also helped on occasions. Women, we learn, were paid sixpence a day for weeding, plus one and a half pence extra for beer. A man for ditching got uh, for ditching got ten pence a rod of sixteen and a half feet. Now, every ditch you dig that's sixteen and a half feet long, you get ten pence, Mister Hat. How do you feel about that? Um, every every what you dig? Sorry, trench. Uh, a ditch. Ditch. Well, how how how, how deep is it? Well, I presume that uh, it's a specific depth, but it would probably be, you know, a spade's depth, you know. I think that's fair. That's not very difficult work. I could do that. Maybe a couple of spades. Sixteen and a half feet. I think, I think that's reasonable. And also, you have to remember that ten pennies is actually quite a lot back then. Indeed. That's, a, that's quite a substantial wage. The land was ploughed in October, with a plough of the type shown in figure ten. So that's the, uh, the one of pl uh, Tull's ploughs. And after it had been harrowed and rolled, the wheat was set in November. Now here is an interesting detail. One would have imagined that by now Toll's drill would have come into general use. In 1776 he developed a plough in early 1700s. Uh, but this had not happened in East Anglia, where the seed was still often set by hand. Later in the course of his journeys, Arthur Young was to discover that wheat was still sown broadcast, dibbed and set by hand, and sown by a drill. It takes a tremendous time in England for new ideas to filter through. Mm. An entry in the Woodford Diary informs us that they finished setting three and a half acres of wheat this even. The quantity of seed wheat to set at the whole was six bushels, one peck. That is, as near as can be, seven and a half pecks to the acre. Expense of setting is eight shillings per acre, allowance, etc. included. I had four dibbers, 16 setters, and they finished the whole in two days. Made very little sense to me, but uh, 
again, you can see how our measurements have changed over time as much as anything else, um, which were yeah. much more in tune with, uh, I suppose, uh, how we, uh, you know, a bushel of wheat made much more sense because that was mm -hmm. what you collected in a, a, yes, a exactly. good a fistful of wheat and then and then put it up. Tied uh, up in a bushel. I can't remember exactly what a peck is off the top of my head, but I think it's a smaller quantity because it's to do with chickens. But mm. um, anyway, from sketches of rural affairs published as late as 1851, we gather that during the mid 19th century, dibbing was extensively practiced in Suffolk. So that's like, um, it's a wooden, it's a long handled wooden instrument, which basically you put some seeds in yeah. and you dip them into the ground sort of one after the other. A dibner. Mm. Hence, hence the name. Uh, yes, dibbling was ext extensively practiced in Suffolk, Norfolk, and the lighter lands of Essex. The soil being duly prepared for the crop, a light roller is passed over it. A man then walks backwards with an iron dibble in each hand, with which he strikes two rolls of holes in each sod, and he is followed by children who drop grains into each hole. The seed mm -hmm. is covered in by a bush harrow and sometimes by another roller. To dibble a hole to set a plant or seed in must uh, or seed in must be a practice nearly as old as the hills. Its application to setting wheat was first advocated by Sir Hugh Platt in 1600 in his book on the setting of corn. Platt traces the idea to a silly wench <laughs> okay. who, when dibbling with some other seed, accidentally dropped wheat on one of the holes. This did so much better than the broadcast sown corn that farmers adopted the method. Wow, there you go. See, again, most of these things are just per chance, you know. Mm. Woodford's dibbling was fairly successful. We hear that he measured a stalk of wheat from a field he had, that had formerly been a furze cover, and that it measured six feet, seven inches tall, and about a barley corn, and when harvested, weighed four stone nine pounds to the bushel. That's wow. quite heavy to be carrying That's, around. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, four stone in kilograms is about... Well, a stone is uh, 13 pounds, and it's 2.2 pounds to the kilo. So mm. 13, 26, 52... 52 pounds, and if we halve that, then that will be, uh, as I say, about nearly 30 kilos that we've got coming up there, basically. Yeah. So not, not light work at all. No. Going through the year, we find that turnips were sell sold for 30 shillings an acre and that they were to be fed off by the sheep, not pulled, by Old Lady Day. Mm. By Old Lady Day. That's a reference to uh, well, presumably the women then or something. Yeah, yeah, I think so. The point of this was that, though the owner of the sheep got feed for them when it was scarce, the land was well manured for the following corn crop. So we mm. come to the harvest in August. The oats were cut in the morning before the dew was off them. They were cut with a sickle, having the form of a reap hook with an edge like a saw. One often sees sickles drawn which are not genuinely sickle-shaped. Uh, and there's a figure, which I'm hoping will come up in a second, which has the, uh, the sickles in question on it. Let me just mm. rotate this again. Uh, back the way we came. That's counterclockwise. Yes, there it is. There's the sickles on the top left uh, page yeah. there. Very impressive looking beast. And again, you come with a small addendum which says, last used in 1873 and with the teeth worn away. And B, right. uh, made in 1870 but unused. The tang is not cranked, but blade and handle are on the same line. Mm. Uh, yes. One often sees sickles drawn which are not genuinely sickle-shaped. Figure 20, this one, has been made from a full-size tracing made from the blades of old specimens, so it should be correct. The Norfolk custom was to give the reapers a good breakfast at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> breakfast at 11, amazing. Well. Mm. That's proper, that's proper. All these people who think they got up at like 4 a.m. or whatever, you know, 11 a.m., mm. good breakfast. Although, uh, to be fair, they, they may have worked before breakfast. Oh, indeed. 
Yeah, probably but, did. I imagine that you, you, 11 o'clock seems very late for farmhands to be getting out of bed. But you must remember it's the harvest time, so there's nothing else really to do. So it's a little bit of, okay. of a break. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so here you go. So the, the breakfast was plum cakes with caraway seeds in them. Ooh, they were wonderful. They were given liquor to drink. Oh, and then party breakfast. And then when they worked, they worked for five hours and were given a good dinner with plum puddings and beer again at four. They did not fare badly. <laughs> they really didn't, did they? I mean, wow. That's proper. In September... Fine, fine country cuisine. In September, it was usual for the harvesters to call upon the principal inhabitants, and each set was given one shilling as a harvest thanksgiving, one supposes. That's a nice bonus, given that you might only earn... Mm you know, 10 pence a day. Um, when one lived as close to the ground as the 18th century countrymen did, a good harvest was a matter for general thanksgiving and happiness. The corn went into the barn and was threshed out on the threshing floor just inside the doors. It was not put into stacks until threshing machines were invented, which could be taken to the stacks. The details of the flail used in threshing are shown in volume two of this series, Everyday Things in England. After the harvest, the farmers settled their accounts, and in a small village, it is easy to understand that the real basis of trade is the exchange of commodities and money only the medium by which this is done. Farmer, miller, carpenter, smith, butcher paid their bills with a few guinea pieces and small change. The farmer let the carpenter have some wheat, which he sent to the miller to grind, but as he had done the work for both of them, it did not take them very long to settle up. Hmm. When the farmer paid their tithes to the parson early in December, they did so at a party, also called a frolic, as it was called in Norfolk, held in the parsonage. It consisted of an excellent meal of roast beef and boiled mutton, with plenty of plum puddings, with wine, punch and ale to drink. Well, don't get me hungry this stream. I've, I've already had <laughs> Wow. The last couple of lines here. The Woodford Diary gives us helpful information about the rent of the land. When Woodford left Amsford for Weston, he let 30 acres in Somerset to a farmer for seven years at no less than £35 per year, the tenant paying all taxes except a land tax. Again, 15 acres of charity land was let at £16.05 uh, in 1801, an estate of 100 acres near Chichester in Sussex was sold for £3,500. So there we go. Um, there is another section on food and drink, but my throat is dying. We have been at this for two hours. <laughs> we so, have. I'm uh, wonderfully calm now. Wonderfully just, just, like, just so, so drifting along with this. This is fantastic. So that's, it's the first 40 pages and the book is considerably long. It is about uh, mm. 200. But um, so there may be many more streams on this to come. We'll see how we go, see what's still interesting. And I'll read ahead a little bit just to make sure we uh, it, it's still good. But um, yeah, I, I hope that um, I know Mr. Hatt has enjoyed himself, but I hope that everyone uh, in the chat has enjoyed this cozy evening together, uh, sort of a return to form for myself uh, and streaming. I should be streaming uh, more regularly uh, in the future as well, which will be a great delight to myself but all mm -hmm. that remains i suppose is um to say thank you very much for listening um and uh thank you for for sticking with me and sticking with the channel and please do uh you know share this stream with your friends and that sort of thing if they're into that sort of thing um mm -hmm. and um and to wish you all a very good night yes indeed have a good night all now take care everyone uh, and uh, we'll see you next time